Good evening. This is our 58th song study of the month for those keeping track at home. Tonight's lesson is entitled God's Family. It's written, the text and the music is both composed by Lanny Wolf, as we'll see in just a few minutes. Taking our text from Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. The song study on the, of the month uh, sheets have been updated on the back, so if there is a hymn that you would like to hear, you can check that list. If it's not on there, get it to me and we'll do it. This, uh, this happens to be a hymn study by request, and uh, so we'll, we're going to study the three stanzas of God's family that we're going to be singing in just a few minutes that Joel's going to lead us in. And before we get there, I wanted us to start looking in Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50. And before, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 12, what I'd like to do is read the first stanza and the chorus of the hymn that we're about to sing. It says, we're part of the family that's been born again, part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together, heartache and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. This song is deeply rooted in scripture as I was preparing for this. Many of the thoughts that are prepared throughout this hymn have, there are several passages we can turn to, and so we're going to be doing that a little bit tonight. But I wanted us to start off in Matthew chapter 12, 46 to 50, just so we understand who God's family is composed of. There are people today that teach that if you, just as long as you believe in Jesus, or even claim to believe in Jesus, or even claim to have a family member that believes in Jesus, and maybe you were born into a religious family of some kind, that we're all part of God's family. And before we even begin such a study on an important topic as God's family, it's important to know what makes us God's family. What draws that brotherly tie, that sisterly tie? What draws us together to make us fellow heirs with Christ that we can be part of God's family? And so Jesus directs, addresses this in Matthew 12, starting in verse 46. It says, While he was still speaking to the crowds, behold, his mother and brothers were standing outside, seeking to speak to him. And someone said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, seeking to speak to you. But Jesus answered the one who was telling him and said, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Notice he didn't just direct his hands over, wave it over all, everyone in general, and say, Everyone that calls on says that they believe in me, are my family. He said, the one that does the will of my Father who is in heaven is my brother, my sister, my mother. Jesus tied obedience to his word with being part of the family of God. And so certainly as we look at the world around us, there are people that they might claim to be members of God's family, but by their lives, by their conduct, by what they believe, what they practice, what they teach, they certainly are not. Jesus said those that, are, that obey him are part of the family. And there are part of the blessings of being a member of the Lord's church is that we are family. Think of this when he says, whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven is family. They, they belong to they, their brothers and sisters to Christ. And he even says it and his mother. But then we find in Mark chapter 10, 28 to 30. Here in Matthew, in Matthew 12, Jesus sets it up that obedience is required. But then Jesus gives us the other promise, the blessing of what it means to be such part of such a large family. That we have a spiritual family the world over. That there is no borders that can, that can contain the Lord's family. In Mark 10, 28-30, it says, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So he makes this twofold promise that if you leave everything for, for him, that you're going to have this spiritual family the world over in this present age, which comes along with persecutions. He says that's part of the territory. Go back to Matthew 10 as he's telling his disciples the rough road and following him is going to entail. He says that's going to come with persecution. But then he says, in the age to come, eternal life. He says, 
you might have, you're going to have brothers and sisters the world over. And there's no possible way for you to meet them all, but you're going to all have eternal life. So then you'll have an eternity getting to know them. He says, this is part of being that family. There's brothers and sisters that we haven't met, that we don't even know about. Why? Because all those that do the will of the Father are Jesus' brothers and sisters, and therefore our brothers and sisters. And looking closely at the church, being tied to being the family or the household of God, we can see the relationships of the saints to the church. And because we can see that relationship to the church, we see that relationship to each other. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, look with me in Ephesians chapter 2. There's a phrase that is used here that I want you to see. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. He says, so then, now remember this, this, he's writing to the saints at Ephesus. And the beginning part of chapter 2 is dealing with that they were Gentiles. So these were Gentile believers. He says, before the blood of Christ reconciled them to the Jews and to God, he said they were, they were lost. They were dead in their, their sins. They dwelt in darkness. They had no hope. They had not God. And they didn't even have what Israel had. But then he says, because of the blood of Christ, going then verses 14 all the way through 16, he talks about how they were reconciled, both Jew and Gentile made alike one new body, one new man, and they're reconciled to God. So he says in verse 19, So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints, and they're of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. He says there in verse 19, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but in fact, you are fellow citizens with the saints, and they're of God's household. He's saying, when he says you're of God's household, he's saying you're part of God's family. You're no longer aliens and strangers, you're sons and daughters. You belong to the family of God. Look in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, 4 through 5. He says, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So this household of God is the church. And in fact, if you go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, that's where Paul's talking to the elders of Ephesus on the Isle of Miletus, and he tells them that Christ purchased the church in his own blood. That's how special the church is to God. That his son bought it in his own blood. Why? So that there would be this close-knit family, this household of God. While you're there in Romans chapter 12, look in verse 10 with me. Romans 12 and verse 10 it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. As members of the family of God, we're to be there for each other. We're to be there for each other in love. Why? Because we are to be a close-knit family. Not just strangers that come in every Sunday and every Wednesday night, maybe, say hi to each other and then leave. We're family. We're supposed to get to know one another. We're supposed to be there for each other. And so that brings us to the hymn that we're going to be studying tonight. God's Family was written in 1974 by a man by the name of Lanny Wolf. And if you'll notice, the date given above his head says 1942 and a dash. He's still alive. This makes him only the second hymn writer that's alive as we do the hymn study. The first was uh, Jamie Owens Collins who wrote The Battle Belongs to the Lord. And when we did that hymn study, she was the first one that we studied that was a live hymn writer. This makes the second as we look at Lanny Wolf. So now I'm going to be reading from this article. It's not very long. There, there's a lot more that could be said of him, but most of it was uh, teaching positions that he held, and so I skipped a lot of that just to kind of talk about the meat of the subject. It says, a song which encourages us to be affectionate one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ is God's family. The text was written and the tune was composed both by Lanny LeVon Wolf, who was born on February 2, 1942 in Columbus, Ohio. At age nine, he began taking piano lessons from Frank Meyer, but did not learn how to read notes, and so he had to play the piano by ear. In 1963, he was married to Marietta Wolf, a talented church musician. He was offered a job at International Christian Life College a United Pentecostal Bible School in Stockton, California. Without any formal training in music, he felt very inadequate about teaching at a Bible college level. 
So he signed up for music theory at San Joaquin Junior College in Stockton, leading him to return to a traditional learning atmosphere, where he eventually received his bachelor's degree in music education from San Jose, California State University. He eventually went on to finish a second master's in the same field and also studied at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, Illinois. And because of, well, as he was training with these two master's degrees, there were a bunch of other jobs and prestigious positions he held. And we can just suffice it to say he became very talented. Continuing on with the article. He directed the Lanny Wolf Singers and Band. And there are still albums out there today that you can purchase if you'd like. This originally consisted of himself, his wife, Marietta, and Dave Peterson. During the 1980s, the group added others as Dave Peterson departed, followed by Marietta, who left to raise their children. Eventually, the trio was comprised of young talent, mostly taken from the student body of the Jackson College of Ministries. His last three albums listed the troupe simply as the Lenny Wolf Singers. And then there is a story behind him writing God's Family. The inspiration to write God's Family in 1974 came after he participated in a meeting with a missionary from Asia who used an interesting illustration. The speaker said that he, he had been invited to share a meal with some local residents of a small community in Asia and noticed as they were finishing their food that others were searching frantically and inquiring about a missing dog. The missionary, as, he, as the story was being told, the missionary made it clear that the missing dog could very well have been part of the meal. The missionary could make the audience laugh one minute and then instantly turn it to sober up everyone's thinking. The experience of laughter and crying just moments apart inspired the lines of God's family. Sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. As Lanny listened to this missionary recount this tale of sitting at this fire and eating with these locals, he felt that he felt all of the all the things that he felt that night listening to that story reminded him of all the emotions which happened in the physical family and saw that they also happen in a family of God. The song was first published in 1974. He won two Dove Awards from the Gospel Music Association in 1984 for the Song of the Year and Songwriter of the Year for his song. He's also known for writing Surely the Presence of the Lord, which is a hymn known to be used in prison ministries. And it's one Joel and I both have sang working out at the prison. So I was shocked to see he's the guy that wrote that hymn that we were introduced to as we started studying out there. As we sing this hymn, we're going to see that as he writes the words, as saints were children of God and were part of God's family. But remember, as he's, as he's writing these words, he's writing them from a sense of this, coming from this denominational Pentecostal movement that pretty much believes if you believe in Jesus, you're part of the family. And that's why I wanted to start this out by looking at what Jesus defined God's family as. And as this man recognizes, as he writes the words, he even recognizes how one is, comes into being part of God's family. The first stanza says, we're born again into God's family. Now his definition of being born again might be different than our definition, but the truth in the scriptures is certainly right. Stanza one says, we're to be part of God's family, or in order to be part of God's family, we must be born again. Stanza one says, we're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of the family that's on its way home. Just as the normal way to enter a physical family is to be born into it, so we must be born again into the family of God. Now as we look at the family of God and the way into it, there are two figures used to show the means of entrance into God's family. The first of which we see in 1 Peter 1, 22-23, talks about this new birth. Jesus talked about this new birth in John 3, 3 through 5, as he told Nicodemus, unless one is born again of the Spirit and water, he cannot enter into the kingdom. We also see 1 Corinthians 12, 13 to 14, that says, we are baptized into the body of Christ. The body, Colossians 1, 18 and Ephesians, all tell us the body is the church. So, in 1 Peter 1, 22 to 23, it says, since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, Fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. So a new birth happens. And while many in the denominational world might teach that this new birth happens when we ask Jesus into our heart, and we say this prayer that is not found in Scripture, the Scriptures teach the new birth happens when we are baptized. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14 says we're baptized into the body. Galatians 3, 27 and 28 tells us we're baptized into Christ. So the only way into Christ and into the body, which is the household of God, is through this new birth, this baptism. But we're also told in Ephesians 1, 5, it's called an adoption, that we are adopted by God as his children. How do we get adopted? We're adopted as we are born again into this family. So Ephesians 1, 5. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And as I read through Ephesians 1, 5, I'm reminded of Romans 8, 15 and 16. And we're going to read that in just a minute, so let's not turn there just now. But while we see these two figures that are used, what we find in both is that by obedience to the gospel and baptism, we become children of God. So the hymn, as we sing the hymn, the hymn is absolutely right. We're part of the family that's been born again. That's the only way to become part of God's family, is through obedience to His will. When we're thus born again, we become part of the spiritual family of God. In Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, we see that saints make up the family of God the world over, which is, goes back to what Jesus said in Matthew 12 and verse 15. Now, if you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. So we would read that in just a few seconds. Romans chapter 8, we're going to back up to verse 14, although on the slide I'm going to have verses 16 to 17. In Romans 8, verse 14, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heir of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. God's children are in his family, the church. We saw in Ephesians 2.19 where Paul told the Ephesians, you're no longer aliens and strangers, but you're saints, your fellow saints. You're, you're members of the household of God. In 1 Timothy 3.5, he calls that household of God the church, which is to be the pillar of truth. So there's a number of things here that we can read of in Romans chapter 8. One, he says, those led by the Spirit are sons of God. This reminds me of John 1 and verse 12, where God said, where the God writing with, as the Holy Spirit through John said, those who believe were granted the right to become children of God. So those led by the Spirit are sons of God. That automatically tells you they believe, and if they believe and are sons of God, they've been baptized. Jesus said that in Mark 16, 16. And they're children by adoption. The Rome, the Paul, writing to the Romans, said that we cry out, Abba, Father. Notice what he says in Galatians chapter 4, 6 to 7. Certainly we see Jesus refer to God, this, God the Father this way in Mark 14, verse 36, as he prays in the garden on the night in which he was betrayed. But no, then Romans 8 tells us that we have that same ability to call out to God in that same familiar term, Abba, Father. And in, in other words, that we use Daddy or Papa, these are words we use for our physical fathers. These are right to use for God. We, sometimes we forget. We get all caught up in coming to Him in this reverent, awe-inspiring moment. But we're told twice that we can come to Him as sons and lay our hearts before Him, calling Him Abba, Father. We see that there in Romans 8. And look at how it's pointed out in Galatians 4, starting in verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I think it's right that we follow in the example that Jesus set when He says, Our Father who is in heaven, or calls God Father. But Jesus also referred to Him as Abba, Father, when He was pouring out His heart to Him there in John 17, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as we see in Mark 14, verse 36, Abba, Father. He, Paul is writing to the Romans and to the Galatians and tells both of them, we have this ability, we are fully sons and daughters, fellow siblings with Christ, that we have the right to call out to God in the same familial term, Abba, Father. In our English language, we don't use Abba, we would insert Daddy or Papa, these familial terms for our fathers. And he points out that we are heirs of God. And if we're heirs of God, then we're fellow heirs with Christ. And if we're fellow heirs with Christ, he says if we suffer with him, we'll be glorified 
So the state of exaltation that Jesus enjoys right now, one day he will come to take his saints, and we too will be exalted in that glorified state as Christ is. The result of having been saved by Jesus and then added to his church is the reward of heaven. If you remember the, the hymn, stanza one says, we're part of the family that's on its way home. Well, this is what Jesus has said. We see that there is this, pro there is this promise of being part of the church. In Acts 2, 46-47, God added to the saved daily. New King James says added to the church, those who are being saved daily. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, saints are baptized into the body. Colossians 1, 18 tells us that's the church. Ephesians 5, 23 says Jesus is the Savior of the body. So again, tying all these things together, it's important that we know that we are part of the body. But more importantly, being part of the body, we experience the blessings of being family with one another. And 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 tells us that we have an inheritance. Remember, we read that in Romans 8, 17. Fellow heirs with Christ. If we're an heir, that means there's an inheritance. Philippi, or 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4 tells us this inheritance is heaven. Jesus said to this to the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2 and verse 10. He said, if they remain faithful until death, they would receive the crown of life. Then over in Revelation 21, 3 through 7, he says, there's coming a time where heaven is, is going to be so great, so powerful, so wonderful, an eternity of God wiping away tears. No more sorrow, no more death, no more crying, no more despair, no more pain. He says, all these things have passed away. And then he says in verse 7, that he who overcomes will inherit these things. That's the inheritance. When we read, when we read there in Romans 8, and talked about being fellow heirs with Christ, heirs of God, being members of his family, that's the inheritance. It's heaven. What is, the, what is the import of that? That's so far away, right? We can't see it, we can't touch it, smell it. Philippians 3.20 tells us heaven is home. So when, this, when we sing in this hymn that we're part of the family on its way home, every day brings us closer. Every day brings us closer. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when we read Ephesians 2.19 and it said you're no longer aliens and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God? What is that citizen? It's of heaven. We're citizens of heaven. Through obedience to the gospel, saints... Too far. Through obedience to the gospel, saints are members of the family of God. It's important that we understand that, that how we become a member of the family is not just by claiming, oh, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I serve Jesus. It's we need to be able to say, I obey Jesus. Jesus said, the one that does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my brother, my sister. Right? And we read in Romans 8 that by, through that obedience, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are sons of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The second stanza of this hymn, says that we are to be bearing sorrow and grief in God's family. And just in a physical family, there are unpleasant times. And there are hard times and difficult times. Sometimes that we weep and cry with one another. The same thing happens in our spiritual families. Stanza 2 says, When a brother meets sorrow, we all feel his grief. When he's passed through the valley, we all feel relief. It's not talking about when he dies. It means when he comes out on the other end of that trouble. Together in sunshine, together in rain. Together in victory through his precious name. Doesn't that invoke memories of our physical families? Times that we stuck it out with a brother or a sister or our parents? Or they stuck it out with us through things that we went through? Just as we feel these emotions in our physical family, we're going to feel them with one another. When fellow Christians are weeping, we're told we should weep with them. Romans 12.15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep. And look at with me in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 26. Because both of these passages are going to deal with the next point we're going to look at. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. Puts it another way. So if you write in your Bibles, I would encourage you to highlight or write in their margin of Romans 12, 15, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and vice versa if it's not already there for you. Because 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, And if one member, he's talking about we're all members of the one body. He says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, 
all the members rejoice with him. So then he says, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. When one member weeps, it's feeling grief and sorrow for things that they're dealing with in life. It's right that just in the physical family, we weep and we sorrow with them. Galatians 6, 2 says, we're to bear one another's burdens. We're to bear one another's burdens. Now, on the reverse part of that, we can't bear one another's burdens if that burden isn't given. That goes back to being part of the family and not strangers, that we share things going on in our lives, that we ask for help when we need it, that we ask for strength and encouragement, we ask for the prayers for the things that we struggle on. Therefore, we unload our burdens, and then the others, we bear each other's burdens. But when fellow Christians experience honor, as we just read in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, we should rejoice with them. Just as we read in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8, we're told that there's a time and season for everything under the sun. There's a time for weeping, there's a time for grief and mourning, but yet there's a time for happiness, for joy, and for singing and laughter. We suffer and we grieve and we sorrow with those that are going through the valley, as the song says. And we rejoice with them when they experience honor or when they come out of the other side of that valley and they're back on top of things. It's right that we rejoice with them. By considering one another and stimulating to love and good works, we together help each other to remain faithful. Just as Hebrews 10, 24-25 says, when we come together, it ought to be to encourage one another. Sometimes part of even encouraging one another is unloading our burdens. Because then we can help one another. We can be there for each other, just as a physical family is there for one another. We can be there for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day he's talking about is the day of the Lord. As we see it draw near with every passing day, or one day closer. We don't know when that time will be. Our job, as we've talked about in many other lessons, is to be ready for it. In Ephesians 4, 14 to 16. In Ephesians 4, 14 to 16. This is that passage that tells us we're not to be, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine. But instead, we're to grow up into Christ. Look, notice what it says. Notice what it says. It says in verse 12 through 13, he's talking about being equipped and being mature. He says, as a result, what result? The result of being mature in Christ. He says, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Much like the workings of the physical body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 31. And 12 through 31, all these passages deal with how we function together, that we don't all have the same ability. The eye can't say to the foot, I, I'm tired of seeing, I want to be the foot. And the fingers can't say, I want to see, I want to be the eye. Our physical bodies don't work that way. So when we come together as the spiritual family, we're made up with different functions, much like the workings of a physical body. We all have different things that we bring to the table. And when we all bring them together, as we see there in Ephesians 4.16, we build each other up in love. And as Hebrews 10.24-25 says, we come together to encourage one another. As members of God's family, we're to bear one another's burdens, to weep, and to rejoice together. We're to bear one another's burdens. We are to weep and rejoice together. This, it, it's so much like our physical family that we ought to be thinking of each other as family. Not just so-and-so we see on Sundays and Wednesdays. But we're brothers and sisters, one to each other, and we ought to be there for one another. That's how God set it up, that we would have family the world over. No boundaries, no borders, no walls and no doors. That all those that are obedient to God are made brothers and sisters and fellow heirs with Christ. And the third stanza tells us that heaven is the home of God's family. 
We touched on that a little bit in stanza one when it said we're part of God's family that's on its way home. So it was important to talk about what the home was. But the third stanza deals with the fact that being part of God's family is part of that hope of being together in heaven. It says, and though some go before us, we'll all meet again. Just inside the city as we enter in, there'll be no more parting. We, Jesus will be together forever, God's family. Some will go on before us, because it is appointed for men once to die. And so as it happens in the physical realm, members of our family die. And if they're members of God's family, we have a hope that we'll see them again. That it's not just a sorrowful parting of the ways that we're never going to see them again. When we lose members of God's family, whether they're in our physical family or in our spiritual family only, when we lose members that we love, we have a hope, not just a wish, we have a hope that we will see them again. We fully expect to do so when we get home. For Christians, we hope to meet again when he returns to take us home. Hebrews 9.27 is where it says it's appointed for men to die once and then comes judgment. But for Christians, we hope to meet again when he returns and he takes us home, whether those who have fallen asleep, as he puts it, or those who remain. In 1 Thessalonians 4, the full context backs up to verse 13, where he's telling them he doesn't want them to be sad. But we're going to pick up in the reading in verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, even though there might be those that go on before us, we have that hope that we'll one day see them and there will be no parting ever again. It says we will always be with the Lord. And so we're to comfort one another with these words. What words is he talking about? The hope of heaven. The hope of one day being with Jesus forever. In Ephesians 2.19, remember it said, Saints are no longer strangers and aliens, but are of God's household. So it's only fitting and right that when Jesus comes again, He takes the saints to be with Him. He promised that in John 14. 1 to 3, He said, I'm going, and if I go, I shall prepare a home for you. If I prepare a home for you, then one day I'm coming to get you, to take you to where I am, and where you'll always be. So, as we talk about that aspect that heaven is our home, we see that we are fellow heirs with Christ in Romans 8, 17. And Philippians 3, 20 says, As fellow heirs of Christ, we are citizens of heaven. And in that home, there'll be no more parting. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow, crying, or pain. Revelation 21, 3 through 7, talks about that new, that new heaven, that new Jerusalem, that new heaven and earth. And picking up in our reading in verse 4, he says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no longer any be any death. There'll be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And then verse 7, he says, He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I'll be his God. And he will be my son. God will wipe away all tears for the ones who overcome and enter in. Members of God's family eagerly wait for our Savior to carry us home. Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven. For which we eagerly wait our Savior. We eagerly await our Savior. As we look at the chorus of this hymn, it reminds us that the closeness God wants for us to be as members of His family is that of a physical family. He says, and sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry, sometimes we share together heartache and sighs, sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. It's important that we talk about that hope. That we talk about seeing one another again. That we're mindful of the fact that this life is not the end when we die. It's really the beginning of an eternity. And we choose in this life how we're going to spend it. And for those that are members of the household of God, we ought to be encouraged and comforted. One with another. That despite the trials that we go through, despite the valleys we might have to hit and bear with one another, that one day there will be an eternity of no more parting. No more sorrow, no more pain or crying. All those things will have passed away. And Jesus says, to the one that overcomes, will enter in. God will be his father, and they will be his son. God has described the church 
in ways that saints can see the closeness to each other and to God. Notice what, how the church is described, these different ways that are very intimate. The church is described as the body of Christ, Colossians 1.18. That we're all members of this one body that we can read of in Ephesians 4. It's described as the household of God, Ephesians 2.19. A family unit with brothers and sisters. Christ is our fellow brother. God is our father. We're called in Romans 8.16, children of God. And as children of God, part of that family, that household, there's a home. Just as in the physical family, the family dwells in a home together. We have a home in heaven, Philippians 3.20. All these different phrases that are used draw our mind to the physical that we can understand it in the spiritual. That we're body, we're the, we're, as the church, we're the body of Christ. He's the head. We do as He commands. We submit to Him. We're the household of God. We're children of God. And as such, we have a home in heaven, as we see in Philippians 3.20. God has designed for men to be born again into the family of God. And once in that family of God, that bear with one another's burdens. And together, eagerly wait for the Savior to take His family home to heaven. This hymn is rich in Scripture as we've pointed out. While the writer might not have understood all of these things, we can see that he at least, what he wrote, fits perfectly with what we read in Scripture and what Jesus has designed for his body, for the church, and for the family of God. So the question tonight, as we look at God's design for men and women to be part of this family of God on its way home, the important question tonight is, are you part of God's family? And remember, the only way to become part of God's family is to be born again into it. And so if you're not a Christian this evening, you are outside the family of God and outside of the blessings and the hope of heaven. You too need to repent and be baptized of your sins, washing away those sins, calling on His name, rising from the waters, as Romans 6, 4 says, walking in newness of life. If you are a Christian this evening in error, remember the honor you've been given as a member of God's family. It truly is an honor and privilege. Jesus says you're going to have family that you'll never meet. The world over. Wherever you go, you can find family. What a blessing. What an honor and what a privilege it is to be part of God's family. So if you have not been living the way that you ought to be, now is the time to make correction and make it right with your God. Whatever your request might be tonight, if you're subject to imitation of Christ in any way, the waters of baptism, the prayers on your behalf, come forward and make it known while we stand and while we sing.